Thank you so much for, for joining me this morning. I hope your weekend was good. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about mine. In this rather weird world that we're living in, uh, this weekend I attended a drive through wedding shower, a drive through graduation party, and a drive through birthday party, and that was just Saturday. And then on the Lord's Day, uh, I, I gathered with my brethren from Kenwood, most of you all, and uh, we worship God in the parking lot. Um, odd times, I guess. Um, but even in these, these really odd times, I, I have to tell you, I, I really, really enjoyed uh, being with my brethren, seeing my brethren. And I especially enjoyed worshiping um, God uh, with his people. So, so I hope uh, that you're well. Um, I, I haven't said this in a while. And as we start this week, Listen, I know for many of you, you're starting to head back to work, and that's certainly a blessing. We've been praying for that. Um, but I still want to put out there, if, if you're not okay, um, if you need something, whether that be spiritually, um, for sure, or if you need something physically, um, please let us know if you're not okay. Um, I, I speak... Um, for the brethren at Kenwood with 100% confidence that, that I, I know we want to be there for, for one another. And, and I know the, the men who lead us as elders, I, I know that they want to be there um, for all of us. So if you need something, um, please let us know. Um, thanks, thanks again for, for reading along um, with me. You know, um, some of you have, when all of this started and we, we began these, uh, these, video, uh, these videos, um, some of you started reading that first day and you've been reading with me ever since. And, um, I, I really appreciate that. And if we have those who are just kind of joining up this week, uh, well, welcome. And, and we just appreciate, um, you, you, you joining us. And, and I'll just say this before we get started. Um, if, if you're wondering kind of what this is, um, at, at Kenwood, we have a daily Bible reading program. And this year we're reading through scripture. We're picking our spots and we're looking at real men and women. Um, that are found in scripture and we're looking at good examples we're looking at some bad examples um, and we're just seeing what we can learn and, and we're looking at these men and women and their interactions with God and we're we're asking the question what would I have done and, and we're looking at the results of the various decisions that are made we want to imitate those good and we want to um, stay away from from that which is bad and um, so I so I pray that the reading will be a blessing to you I, I pray for those of you who have been doing this that it's been a blessing to your life and I, I really appreciate you doing this with me. So this week, we're going to be uh, picking our spots in, in the book of 1 Samuel. It's found in your Old Testament. Uh, a little background, First and Second Samuel, they're going to cover uh, a period of time of about 125 years. And most scholars date the books around 990 to 865 B.C. or so. And, and like the book of Ruth that we, we just finished up with, and then you love the book of Ruth, uh, these books, this, these these books, first and second Samuel, they take place during, um, still during the period of the judges. Now, Eli and, and Samuel, um, prominent figures, especially in the first part um, of First Samuel, they're the last really recognized judges in Israel before we um, usher in this period of, of kings. And when the man of God Samuel is born, uh, to no surprise, if you've been reading along with us, it's a dark. Um, time spiritually for the people of God. Um, Eli, who is the high priest, the Bible tells us that he has two sons, and, and uh, for lack of a better term, they're, they're really just utterly um, worthless. Um, chapter 2 and verse 12 basically tells us that of 1 Samuel. And, and the people really are, are continuing to be characterized by idolatry. The Philistines, and an arch enemy of God's people, they're in power. The people have literally, well, they've lost their identity. Um, so as Samuel comes on the scene, as is recorded um, in 1 Samuel, he, he's most needed. and He's going to prove to be um, really a, a bright spot in these people's, uh, well, really a bright spot in just a lot of darkness, much like Boaz, much like Ruth. Um, and he's going to prove to be a, a most godly man and, and a wonderful leader for the most part. And throughout really the first part of 1 Samuel, God is um, on more than one occasion, he, he's going to differentiate between the evil sons of Eli, the high priest, and the godly character uh, of Samuel. And, and all of this is going to come to really a tragic end as, 
as um, as these wicked men, they're, they're going to die. And then Eli, tragically, he himself is going to die. And this is going to leave Samuel as the lone judge and really prophet of Israel um, during this time. So when we think about 1 Samuel, really the first seven or so chapters of the book that, that we're not going to um, be reading together, I would encourage you to read it on your own. They're really chapters of defeat. And as much as those chapters in the book of Joshua were chapters of victory, these are chapters uh, of laws. Our reading today is going to come from, from 1 Samuel chapter 8, but I, I would encourage you, as I said a moment ago, to, to spend some time in those first seven chapters. And what you're going to find is God's people losing. They're losing vast amounts of men in battles with their enemies. And those enemies in, in which you remember, they refused to, to drive out of the land completely. We, we chronicled that in the first couple of chapters of the book of Judges. Um, they're going to lose 4,000 men in a battle with the Philistines. And they're going to turn around and lose 30,000 men in another battle. And then when things look like they can't get any worse, well, in the midst of these battles, they're going to lose on the Ark of the Covenant, and, and, and through God's workings, the Ark is going to be returned, but then they're going to lose 50,000 men when those men disobey God and look upon the Ark of the Covenant, which they were instructed uh, and not to do, and so you have just this awful scene, but when you get to 1 Samuel chapter 7, and you have God's people losing, losing big, we get a snapshot, we get a glimpse into the type of leader, the type of man um, that Samuel was. And I, I want you to listen as he implores the people um, to turn back to God. Uh, 1 Samuel 7, look with me at verse 3. It says, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, Remove the foreign gods and the asherah from among you and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone. He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel removed the bells and the asherah and served the Lord alone. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. Verse 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 7 says, They gathered to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord and Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mizpah. And when the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered to Mizpah, the Lord of the Philistines went up against Israel. When the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Then the sons of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel, in verse 9, took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them, so that they were routed before Israel. The men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as, as far as Beth, as far as, as Beth Kar. Samuel's uh, message to the people in the midst of all of this misery, in the midst of all of this defeat. In essence, Samuel, like all the great prophets of God, he says, listen, you, you got to turn back to God. He, he shares with them and he instructs them here in regards to, to how to be successful. And it's the same old refrain. They needed to change. In humility, they needed to repent. They needed to, to turn back to God. And shocker alert, right? How often have we seen this? When they did this, things got better. From losing to being victorious. Such a simple formula. Turn back to God. When you turn back to God, things get better. I need to hear that. And so in the book of 1 Samuel, it's going to chronicle really three major characters, three men, Samuel, Saul, and David. All familiar names to us. And for our study this week and probably next week, we're going to focus on Israel's first king, that being Saul. Chapter 8 is where our reading is today, and I apologize for the length of the setup, but, but I think it'll help you. Chapter 8 begins with the acknowledgement that Samuel, this great leader, he's old. And that happens, right? And, and leaders won't always be around. So what then? Who's going to fill his shoes? Well, the logical answer here would be Samuel's son. Samuel has blessed, been blessed with offspring. He's been blessed with sons. But as we're going to see, beginning at verse 3, um, they weren't like 
Samuel. Let, let's read chapter 8 together. First Samuel um, chapter 8. Let, let's read it together. If you're curious um, about these, I've been having these terrible headaches. Kylie saw me reading those. She said, you know you're splitting. So I've been putting these off. I bought these a while back. Um, long story short, um, I, I guess I'm just getting old and I need these. Um, but just want to read. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, begin reading with me at verse 1. And it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his son judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second Abijah, and they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. Verse 7 said, The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, and they, they've forsaken me and served other gods, and so they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. Listen to God. Look at verse 10. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord of the people who had asked him of him a, a king. And he said, this will be the procedure of the kings who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in the chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties and some to do his plowing and to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfume, for perfumers and cooks and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will also take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you've chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there should be a king over us. That we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. After Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. Verse 22 says, The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to their voice. Appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. You know, like his predecessor, Eli, Samuel's sons, well, they weren't good. Verse 3 tells us that his sons did not walk in his ways but turned aside after dishonest gains. They took bribes, verse 3 says, and they perverted justice. They weren't like him. As for the reason, we're not told. But certainly and this must have been heartbreaking for Samuel. And all of this leads to this rather, well, silly and, terrible request or, or, or demand, um, I guess you might say. They demand a king. Verse 5 tells us to judge us like all the nations. I want you to think about that. Samuel, who no doubt, as all leaders do, he had sacrificed so much for the people, maybe even his sons, unfortunately. And Samuel, he takes this personal, Takes it personally, but, but God, God ultimately sees this for exactly what it is. In fact, he tells Samuel, listen, Samuel, be clear. They're not rejecting you. God says, listen, they're rejecting me. And, and I'm reminded here, brethren and friends, none of this rebellion was lost on God. He knew what these people had become. He knew what was in their heart. And he tells Samuel in verse 8, in essence, this is who they are. This is what they do. They forsake me. They serve other gods. This is their history. I've seen it all. So in verse 9, God says, listen, Samuel, give them what they want. Give them what they want. But in an act of grace, I would argue, an act really of God's discipline by way of warning them, he tells Samuel to tell them exactly what they're asking for. You know, here, here's what's kind of ironic about this, if you think about it. You know, God's people. 
They were to be different. Um, they were to be peculiarly different in the sense that they were to be holy, properly different. They were to show the world as God's chosen people through their blessings by way of their obedience that as a result of being God's people, listen, there's a different way. In fact, it's a better way. Through them, through their blessings, through their success, they were supposed to show the world the one true God, and in that, God would be glorified. But isn't it interesting? They didn't want to be different. They wanted to be like everyone else. And God doesn't, he doesn't stop their ridiculous and foolish behavior. And just as he allows us to be foolish and even ridiculous at times, but not before warning us, by grace, God always warns us. God's word warns us. God's word, it corrects us. And listen to this. God's word, it always shows us a better way. We get that, right? And beginning in verse 10, that's exactly what God does here. He's going to warn them. He's going to tell them exactly what this king is going to be. God says, listen to me. Through Samuel, he's going to take your children and he's going to make them slaves. They're going to work for this supposed king that you want. He's going to take your best fields for himself. He's going to tax you. He's going to tag, take a tenth of your grains. He's going to take your best, your best servants, your best animals, and he's going to put them to work, not for you, but for himself. And he's going to make your life miserable to the point that you're going to cry out to me, God says, the one true living God, the one true king. In other words, God says, you don't know what you're asking Man, how often have I been right here? How often have I thought that I know what's best? That I think I know exactly what I want. And I look at the world around me. I want what he's got. I want that. And then you read in God's word. That's not what's best. That's a terrible choice according to God and his word. And God says, this is what you need. And God says, this is what will happen if you go down that road. Oh, no, 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 not me. It won't happen to me. I'll, I'll be the exception. You, you've never thought like that, right? I'm the only one. No, I know better. We've all been here. You know, you know, here's the thing. I, I was thinking about it like this. You know, Israel, they could see what it was like for these people in these other nations. And I don't believe for a second that this was completely lost on them, that, that it was just great to be people of uh, these other nations. I, 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 they saw, they may have saw some, seen some good, but they also saw the bad. I, I don't believe this was lost on them, but it was going to be different for them. And how often has God's word been clear? We got the message. We understood God's will, but we simply chose to ignore it. We chose what we wanted in the moment as opposed to what God said. And we thought it would turn out different for us, but it doesn't. And by experience, there's a lot of us running around who um, can tell you God's always right. His way is always best. I've said it a million times, and I'll continue to say it. I've got a lot of regrets. Not once have I regretted listening to God. Not once have I regretted doing it God's way. So here's the problem. They were stubborn. And they wouldn't listen. Even after Samuel warns them, even after he tells them how bad this is going to be for them, they insist on their own will. They insist on a king. And look at verse 20. They want to be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our, our battles. That's what they want. They want a king to go out before them. And I'm just thinking back to all those victories where God went before them. How insulting to God. Their history 
was one of a king who had fought their battles for them. How do they think that they're even in the land that they're in? God had delivered them over and over and over. He blessed them over and over and over. In chapter 7, we just read of this victory where God gives them the victory when they turn to him. But what do they want? They wanted a king to deliver them. They didn't even make the connection that God had just done this for them. And God says, listen, listen to their voice and the point I'm a king. So I want to close with this, and, and, and I want to be blunt, and, and I hope that you'll take it in the spirit that it's intended. There's only one way that works. That's God's way. And if you choose another way, if you choose to be like everyone else, you're going to end up like everyone else. Look around. Look around. It doesn't work. It's never worked, and it never will work. And God warns us there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is destruction, Proverbs 14, 12. So let's learn, brethren. Let's don't be stubborn. Let's listen to God, the one who has proven over and over and over and over that he is for us. Thanks for reading with me today. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Father, we are so thankful that you are our king. As a result of your son and his sacrifice, we have the ability to be citizens of your kingdom. A kingdom unlike any of the kingdoms of this world that are all temporal in nature, kingdoms that rise and fall. Father, we are citizens of your kingdom, an eternal kingdom that will stand forever. Father, we don't deserve that. But Father, what a blessing it is to know that you are our king, a king that provides us victory, a king that forgives us of our transgressions, a king that has always been for us, is for us now and will always be for us, a king who put a plan in place to ultimately save us and give us victory in the end. Father, we are so very thankful for you, thankful for all that you do for us. And Father, we ask that you would continue to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.